Hello. Welcome to the Cambia Grove. I'm Molly Moore. I am the creator of opportunities here at the Cambia Grove. They let us make up our own titles, so that was mine. <laughs> um, how many of you have been here before? Yes, new people. Hi, new people. I'm Molly. I work here, and it's so fun because we host things like this about once a week. So the space that you're sitting in is a workspace by day and an event space by night. And somebody has the best ringer I've ever heard. <laughs> um, and we, we get the opportunity to host um, on very important topics, um, like the one we'll be discussing tonight. And we get the opportunity to host on topics that actually help propel our healthcare innovation community forward. So that includes helping entrepreneurs understand um, what it's like to work with large healthcare enterprises and helping large healthcare enterprises understand what it's like to work with startups. And so we have a very great job um, that we get to connect those two communities together to propel innovation here in the Pacific Northwest. So you are at the first of three social determinants on health event, and we have two more. And so if you um, find the topics lively tonight and you find the conversation lively tonight, I encourage you to attend the next two. Um, September 8th is regarding the access conundrum. So we'll be discussing barriers to access. And then on September 29th, innovations that are um, actually reducing health disparities. So um, please do join us uh, those two dates if you're able to. I also get the pleasure of introducing Mary Kay O'Neill, Dr. Mary Kay O'Neill. She is a partner at Mercer and she's been banging around the Washington state healthcare market for probably longer than she cares to admit. <laughs> Um, but you have everybody's bios in front of you, and I encourage you to um, uh, talk with these folks, ask questions, um, be curious, and um, please do remember if you do ask a question, we want to hand you a mic. We're live broadcasting, and um, we'll also have a chat tool feature up. Um, you can log on to our website on your phone and use that chat tool if you um, don't want to ask a question in person. So without any further ado, welcome to the Cambia Grove and welcome Mary Kay O'Neill. Thanks so much, Molly. Um, I'm really honored to be here and to be asked to moderate this panel, which I already know is going to make my job infinitely easier because they know all kinds of stuff and have a lot of good things to say. Um, I'm, this is really um, a, such an important topic and such a huge topic, it's actually pretty brave of Cambia Grove to tackle it. Um, so thinking about this in a run-up, I was trying to figure out how best to use the talent and how best to interact with the people that have shown up for this uh, event today. And so um, I asked David, who was our chief organizer, if he could put our bios and everything in print so we wouldn't have to spend any time on that, but please, if you have questions ab about anything, let, let us know. I also asked him to use this, um, this symbol that's behind you, and this comes from the uh, Healthy People 2020 project, which is run by the Surgeon General. And this is the social determinant of health logo, basically, or diagram. And I'm going to talk just a little bit about what the different components are within that. Um, but that's sort of the framework for us to talk about today. I, I do think it's scary, I, after being in, involved in many different topics and processes in my career, that it, when you have a, a bunch of circles connected by lines in a circle, that indicates it's really hard to know where to start, right? <laughs> and actually, probably, if it was a totally accurate diagram, there would be lines from every small circle to every other circle. So social determinants, unbelievably important, very interactive in their nature. Um, but I think it's going to be very interesting to have each of the panelists talk about the areas where they're dealing with these issues, the impacts, their successes, major barriers, and those kinds of things. 
But one other thing I said I'd do before we really got launched into this is ask for a show of hands of people who are currently really working with social determinants in their regular work or how they're spending their time, who, who are in the social determinants world. All right, so that's, so there's a lot of people here who, are, who apparently have come for curiosity and want to learn about this, so okay. So looking at this diagram uh, of the social determinants, I just was going to give a little detail and then I'm going to just hand this off down, down the line to have people talk about you know, their spot on the circle or spots. So if you look at those different circles, uh, there's one called economic stability and people probably understand or have heard, you know, things to do with the economic status of a person is very highly predictive of their health status and their disease burden and uh, their longevity. So uh, economic stability has to do with poverty, employment, food security. If you guys know what food security is, it's people having the confidence they'll be able to purchase enough food to eat through the course of a month. Uh, that was pretty much pioneered by Adam Junoski at University of Washington. He's done some great work on that. And also something that's been a lot in the news and I think Seattle can be proud about is uh, housing stability. We had a great support for our recent housing uh, levy. Ne next circle being education and of course that is everything from early childhood education to high school graduation rates to enrollment in higher education. and and the populace having the language and literacy skills to take advantage of educational systems. So um, each piece is very important, but the high school graduation rate's been a public health metric for years, um, so that, because the correlation is so high between that and health behaviors and health outcomes. There's a social and community context, which has to do with things like discrimination, incarceration, uh, civic participation, social cohesion, certainly neighborhoods that are better or significantly worse for that. Um, and, uh, you know, that also has been in the press. There's health and healthcare access, which is probably, we were saying, different analysis 10 to 20 percent of the health outcomes is ha having to do with that, although number of people on this panel probably spent a huge amount of their lives on that. So that's access to health care, primary care, and health literacy. And then there's the neighborhood and the built environment. So that's quality housing, um, you know, even active communities like walkability um, status, status of a different community, environmental conditions, crime and, um, and uh, violence in the community, and also um, access to healthy food. There's this concept of food deserts, certain parts of the world where your best nutritional source is probably potato chips at the corner store, which is a bad indicator for health outcomes. So with that, I'm going to just ask each person to give a little bit about their current role and how they're encountering this and go down the line. And hopefully you guys will be coming up with some great questions by the time we get to Mark. Whoops, Michael. One of my determinants is not working. <laughs> Sorry. Does my determinant work? Yes, it does. Okay. I'm Bob Crittenden. I'm with the governor's office, and I do uh, uh, health. But basically, right now, I'm working on health reform issues more than anything else. Um, the, uh, we have, a, from the state perspective, a huge sweep of uh, impact we have, mainly through Medicaid, uh, a lot of the mental health, substance abuse, and uh, housing, and a number of other things. But I want to leave you with a few points. One is that we always talk about, I've lived in the world of health care. Health care is great. I, I enjoyed it. Uh, but after 40 years of it, it's clear that it's not enough. We really have to, to intercede upper, upstream a little bit. And, uh, with, and even though I've worked with vulnerable populations, you know, you can move things a little bit, but you can't move the needle in a big way. And we need to move upstream. So a couple of quick points I do want to make is that there are a lot of policies out there, but implementing them is actually hard to do. And we're in the process of now doing it. We have to do it well. And uh, so there's a lot of implementation going on. And how do we do that and make it work is, is a challenge. Um, one of the challenges also, we need an ROI. We, you know, the state doesn't have infinite money. It has to actually 
live within its means, so we really have to f focus on how everything we do has to have an ROI of about five years. Otherwise, it probably won't be sustainable over time. Um, to do that, though, we have to really integrate how we finance things. You know, in other words, you save money. You may invest in, say, mental health, but when you do that, you save money in medical care. And if we don't have a way to move the funds between the two, we have we don't have a virtuous cycle of, of continued investment, and you lose the, the benefit of it. So we have to figure that out. And lastly, uh, we, I think it's important for us to understand that this is a rare time that we're actually talking about this. I mean, we've been thinking about these things for a long time, and rarely in the state have we really had a time when we're actually having serious conversations and looking at policies and trying to implement policies that do something. And we have to be successful doing it. And I always think that we have to have good luck, and good luck for me is always the opportunity, which we have now, and it's with, um, uh, joined with preparation, which we really need to work at. So we have a lot of work to do, but I'd love to talk to you more as, you, as we get further. So I'm Danette York. I am the Director of Public Health and Social Services in Lewis County. So uh, 35 LHJs are local health jurisdictions in the state of Washington, and out of those 35, my agency is one of about 13 to 15 that is a combined agency. So social services, or some people refer to it as human services, combined with public health. And so having that combined agency, we live social determinants, determinants of health on a daily basis. Uh, we're constantly looking for housing um, for our indigent population, homeless popu population. That's huge in our area right now. So is um, our graduation rates. Uh, we are actually increasing somewhat over the past few years, so we're excited about that. Uh, we're looking at after our last community health assessment, and we're in the process of doing our improvement plan at this point. We're looking at trying to bring in um, higher education that is other than four-year colleges or even two-year colleges, looking at trade skills, trying to get people, the students that are not going to be moving forward to those colleges to develop a skill, be trained in plumbing, electrical, uh, cosmetology, those types of things, so that they can make a living wage. Uh, like I said, we do this on a daily basis. It's very, very difficult. Um, I'm representing both my department, which is a rural health agency, and our accountable community of health, uh, which is a seven-county region. And uh, most of those, at least, are either very rural or have rural areas within their counties and so we face challenges every day that are different from those that you would see closer into the city like Seattle um, but challenges just the same so I hope that I can help contribute and answer any questions for you as we go forward thank you I feel like it's a small space. I don't know if I need this, but um, my name is Rashmi Sharma. I'm a palliative care physician at the University of Washington and a health services researcher. So I wanted to kind of give you an idea about the role of research as we think about social determinants of health. Uh, and the main takeaway, I think, is that we need more data still and the importance of doing research in this area and generating more data. So thinking about one, what is driving the differences that we see. So really understanding how do things like race, ethnicity, gender, education level, access to healthcare translate into differences in clinical outcomes. So that's one piece of it. And then the other piece is how do we then evaluate interventions to improve and address those issues. At the end of the day, we're trying to improve the quality of care uh, in my case, as a palliative care physician, that's actually the quality of end-of-life care. Um, but so how do we re address the disparities that we know are translating into things like costs of care, length of stay in the hospital, um, quality of life, distress levels, things like that. So how do we address those issues 
in a way that we can measure um, and, and verify that we're actually making a difference. So that's kind of the role of research, to give us more data so that we can, one, develop interventions to address those issues and then evaluate those interventions to make sure that we're funding um, measures that are going to actually make a difference at the patient and then eventually community level. Hi, uh, Michael Erickson. I'm the Chief Executive Officer for Neighbor Care Health. Uh, I want to give you a couple of quick things about our organization um, and then some quick stories to kind of illustrate uh, some of these uh, points of impact. Um, Neighbor Care has 28 medical clinics and school-based clinics throughout the Seattle area. Uh, we've served about 62,000 patients in 2015, 250,000 services or, or, or visits to that population. 75% of the population is at 200% of our federal poverty level or less. Um, there's been over 10,000 uh, outreach to homeless people, and we run and manage two homeless clinics. And so our entire focus is reducing the access points and the disparities that access to uh, capable primary care, dental care, and behavioral health create. So we really are on the front end or the front line, if you will, of responding to the determinants that have created the disparities that are leading to these uh, profound situations. And I'm gonna give you a four quick, very quick stories. One's m m my, my personal story, and that is why I'm here. So I been was hired six months ago uh, to lead this organization, and I came out of a very well-to-do and rich delivery system in Northern California where we gave um, five million a year to federally qualified health care centers to go do good work. We were taking care of the well-to-do. At some point in my career, uh, which was at the beginning, I said, I'm here to figure out how to create access uh, for people that otherwise have challenges. And there comes a point in one's career where you're doing some work and you say, wait a minute, I'm actually not living true to my values. So for me to come here to this organization, and I'm very proud of this organization to be a part of it, it's because uh, I want to be in the space of figuring out how we address this more profound issue in our culture and our society. A uh, couple of quick patient stories just to sort of bring this to light. Our homeless outreach workers were in a tent city, identified a man that um, had pretty profound sores, uh, that the results of his diabetes that was out of control, not well treated, figured out how to get this a uh, man who also had mental health concerns, was very distrusting of a healthcare outreach worker, worked uh, many days to gain enough trust to get this man to Harborview, by which a vascular surgeon was able to start the wound healing process. And imagine a nurse going to a tent to figure out how to help this man's wound heal so he could put on his shoe and go to work which is what he had was a nominal job from our perspective. And what did this man need? He needed a lot of help and support to try and stay in a job that eventually he could come out of that tent and get into a stable housing. Uh, all of the social determinants were at play in many ways with this one story. Pretty, pretty important. This is the front line of healthcare if you're really gonna uh, live the dream. Uh, the, the second story is I had a chance to shadow one of our dentists in, in a dental clinic. And uh, part of this is the discipline I uh, have as an administrator to get close to where our teams live and work so I understand what they're, what they're responding to. Young man, mid-20s, uh, the dentist worked with this young man. He had come to us out of a recovery center uh, from a crack cocaine addiction. The dentist said, all of the teeth in your mouth have to come out. And here's the interesting part of the story that Bob and others uh, are helping us sort of figure out. It was, we, it was gonna be medically approved and we, we were gonna get reimbursed to take the teeth out. His ability to get dentures was nil. So there come, there's our challenge, right? So we're, we're on the front line recognizing these issues and we're not com, uh, complete around them. 
four story. Um, uh, I do new employee orientation for our employees, and this goes to the economic bubble that's uh, there on the slide deck. There's a young woman in there that says to me, I was homeless in Texas, I was homeless in California, I was homeless when I landed in Seattle. Your healthcare outreach worker found me, got me connected to healthcare services, I'm doing better now, I applied for a job with you, and I'm now coming to work with you. So there's the full cycle of trying to t interrupt a determinant and a trajectory that's underway here and to try and intervene in ways that, that make real uh, change happen. So enough, enough said, now we're gonna have some additional conversation. Keep a couple facts in mind uh, as we think about this. There are far, uh, while we take care of 62,000 patients, we should be taking care of at least triple that amount in Seattle. Uh, through these uh, lower uh, points of access, meaning that we're reducing the, uh, the barriers to access by going to schools, by going now to housing units where we're actually standing up clinics, clinics and housing units. We're far from having solved this problem, but uh, well under the way and great to have great partners with us. So is anybody ready with some questions? Or we have some questions prepared, but we'd really like to know what you're thinking or wondering if anybody's ready to start. I do have a question for um, Bob no. on the end. Thank you. Um, so I saw that you were involved in bringing the patient-centered medical home model, Michael, to um, group health, and I was wondering what role, if at all, social determinants played in setting up that model. You know, at the time that we set that up, um, I, I don't know that we had, um, beyond thinking holistically about health and health care, um, we weren't thinking around going to patients in housing. We weren't necessarily thinking around these outreach activities that I highlighted. We, we were pretty focused on the health care when a patient comes into a medical center how to make that healthcare experience much more patient-centered and holistic, uh, to try and change re trajectories on how much specialty care utilization or unplanned visits to EDs, uh, emergency departments, um, using the best of evidence to uh, keep them well or, or move them closer to health. We were not, we were not focused on the, uh, the determinants, if you will, nor around populations that, uh, that are bringing huge disparities into the equation. It was really focused on healthcare as you would know it today. Uh, having said that, it, it was profoundly necessary for us to put the patient at the center and bring a team around that, pa that patient to think differently around the healthcare they needed. That moved uh, the dial in healthcare in many ways um, and all good things, but this is a much different circle to be thinking about. This question's for any of you, um, and you're doing a lot of great work, a lot of great outreach. There's a lot of healthcare providers in our community. How are other healthcare providers contributing to solving this issue? You want to talk about Lewis County? Bob? So, down south a little bit in our county, we work with all of our partners and healthcare providers are definitely right there at the top of the list. And we have two hospitals. Uh, one is Providence Centralia and the other is Morton General Hospital. And both hospitals have representatives that come to our health partnership group, which is a collaboration of anyone in, that represents any agency within the county that cares about health, the health of our community. And so we work closely together uh, to develop a core team that does our community health assessments. We try to uh, get those um, collaborated to where everyone does them together at the time that we need to send in our reports on what we found. Um, beyond that, we have public health nurses that work with our uh, 
family physicians on a daily basis and all of our clinics for our immunization rates and et cetera. So it's just a big community for us and we continually stay in contact. Anything comes up, any disease outbreaks, anything that each other can help with, we pick up the phone and call. That's um, a lot easier in a rural area. That's one of the advantages of being in a small jurisdiction is we all know one another and we know who to call. I'm not so sure that that would be as simple here, so someone else may want to touch on that as well. Well, just a couple, of, I'd like to just go up a little bit in the elevator um, to your question, not that you asked this specifically, but um, what's most profound as I've stepped into this world and this work is the importance of our uh, legislators. So whether it be a city council member who you meet with and you say, what's it gonna take to pass a city levy or a county levy around housing, those kind of partnerships to actually move this dial is, is profound, whether it's state level. And we have some high quality and, and profoundly powerful people that are trying to do the right thing here. So uh, uh, that, that, that really does for me, it really is uh, it's striking that it starts at this policy level. Um, uh, Bob represents in many ways uh, the absolute right impulse inside a government to figure out how these funding streams that are segregated and isolated in islands between behavioral health and medical, between how you even think about housing and medical, starting to think around how do you recapture these dollars and, and have them actually support where you're going to have an impact is profoundly important as well. And I would say that many of our providers still are being reinforced to live in, in, in about a decade old world relative to what this lives. And we still have a lot of work to do to get aligned both financing and providers because most of the provider's impulse is to do the right thing. I very, very rarely do you find a provider that does want to do the right thing. Uh, but oftentimes they're reinforced and not uh, and not reinforced uh, to really think differently about this world. Could I make one comment too? Is that <clears throat> I worked in a private practice and then at Harborview at different times in my life, as well as a community health center. And um, when you're at the provider level, the doctor level, particularly, you are busy, you know, looking at the individual, and you know there's things that are impacting the the person much more broadly. It's just really hard to to do much about those. And so you rely on certain things. We brought my first hire when I started a clinic back in 79 was to hire a social worker so we could do some things, but that's the person who did it. I mean, I didn't. And when at Harborview, when we developed a primary care medical home, taking some of your good ideas, uh, we put it, brought in behavioral health and everything else, but we still, those and our social worker, and they're the ones that made the contact. So, you know, we all have our roles, but you know we have. We also know that that we have to be humble about how much impact we have too. You know, we do. It's important, necessary, but not sufficient to to take good care. So I think how do we go and reach more broadly? That's where the very difficult part of this is, and that's what we're trying to contend with. And so the state's doing some work around healthier Washington. The state, the counties, you know, with their 0.1 percent, they're doing some very good mm -hmm. things. The ACHs are looking at what they can do. Um, community health centers. I mean, everybody's. One good thing right now is I think everybody's saying, well, we have a problem that we need to address, and what can we do? Um, my big fear is that we get to a point people will say, oh, we can't do anymore, and we're going to stop. I think that right now everybody's leaning into it in a good way. And we have to help them keep leaning into it until we actually start making some real irreversible progress. Hi, uh, Howard Springer here. And uh, I appreciate the um, panel up there with all the, the different representation. And, and so uh, Michael's talked about, I think he used the word silos, financing silos, and uh, Dr. Crittenden. Bob talked about the uh, virtuous cycle of continuous investment, and I'm just dying to hear each of your perspectives as to um, how do we set up this virtuous cycle of continuous investment from your perspective? Because right now you're paid, and each one of you is in a box, uh, in one of those circles up there, 
and it and they're not really connected uh, from a funding perspective but the services overlap right uh, in many respects so going forward I'd be interested to know your perspective as to how this virtuous cycle um, of continuous investment should work if you would is that a research I'll follow, question? I'll, I'll, I'll follow you, Bob. <laughs> okay. Um, from my perspective, I agree with you that there, we have silos, we have all differences. Even the state government, we have uh, all of our mental health. Look at that. We have severely mentally ill in one whole agency and all the mild, moderate mentally ill in a different agency. And then once you click over, you flip over to a different agency, but you leave your health care over there, and it, it, it doesn't make sense. What we're doing right now is we're moving DBHR, which is our mental health, into HCA so we can do full contracting along this, that whole um, continuum. And also we're looking at ways that we can do uh, what's called um, shared, uh, oh, what's, what's the right word? Anyway, if you save money and reinvest that you can actually can save some money, shared uh, kind of savings, what they call it. But anyway, the idea that we can restructure our contracts so we can actually incent that particular good behavior of, of virtuous cycle. Without, right now, the way it happens is if you save money in HCA, what about it? you invest, let's say you invest in DSHS and mental health, where do you get the savings? Almost all the savings is in hospitalizations for diabetes, congestive heart failure. So you save money in HCA. Well, the, uh, the, our, our, our budgeteers, and rightfully so, carve that money back into the general fund if you have savings or at least the below trend. And so that goes back, but it never, or rarely, gets invested in a general way up front, in the up, upstream. So can we do this within one financial, uh, uh, say, uh, fiduciary, one, one financial structure, so that there can be some shared savings, so somebody will invest upstream, and we're trying to develop our contracts uh, that actually can do that. So that's part of, the, that's our approach to it, at least at this point. And the, the unification of the bottom line, even beyond behavioral and medical health, to understand what the healthcare payoff would be to have um, really great educational systems and really great housing resources, that's even more challenging because sometimes those agency folks hardly talk. But we, uh, I think, Danette, were you involved in the uh, Essentials of Childhood project that was here? I don't remember, but um, th this was a very interesting grant that came in, and it was between the Department of Early Learning and the Department of Health, and they were really looking at what do kids need to get the right start. They dealt a lot with uh, this area of uh, adverse childhood experiences, which, which are uh, traumas that kids experience, and there's a very high correlation with bad health outcomes and, and uh, bad educational outcomes and others. Uh, through the lifespan, the more um, burden a, a kid has during their childhood. So, I mean, there so there are these little uh, connection points, but it's been really hard to say, you know, this this investment will lead to this return because the return hits on another budget's bottom line. So, I think it's it's really the challenge for the community to keep this this viewpoint and the connection pieces uh, in focus, and that's a challenge. So. Um, I, I would, um, the Accountable Communities of Health is trying to do this, um, and Lewis County seems to be a little farther ahead than many of us, and what's being sought from CMS on the waiver application from the state is also trying to do this, and that is the state literally going to CMS to say, front load some dollars to us. We will not spend them in health care in the way they've been spent in the previous year or two, will invest in the kinds of things that are gonna change the trajectory here based on the hypothesis that if you change some of those trajectories, you're gonna have less expenses in healthcare. Now, accountable communities in health, depending on the part of the state you're in, are a little mired down in process and not in results yet, but it's the right, absolute right impulse of the state to say, I'm gonna figure out how to go get some future money that we would have otherwise spent an inefficient or less than effective healthcare delivery, I'm gonna put it into outreach into housing activities, I'm gonna put it into outreach to uh, familiar faces that show up in the judicial system, 
um, who actually really need treatment uh, at a core fundamental level rather than jail treatment. So the impulse is exactly right. The execution of that is enormously difficult, but I would say Washington is trying to do the right thing. And I would just add that uh, through the accountable communities of health, we are trying to move that upstream as far as possible, but what is needed um, most of all, in my viewpoint, is data in order to show that we are making a difference and we are achieving the return on investment, which takes time. It, it's not a quick turnaround. We're talking years down the road is when we will, will really uh, see the savings that we are trying to reach right now. And so we've got to track that data and be able to show the powers that be speaking from a local health jurisdiction perspective, we're at the mercy of the legislature and even our local council's um, current expense or general fund that they're the ones that are funding us or grants. So we have to really constantly keep on top of all of the data that, and show them what we're doing in order to continue that funding or getting some reinvestment into the prevention efforts. So, uh, Danette, I did want to follow up on your point there, and I guess it's really anyone the panel could address it. You talked about the importance of data, uh, but you also noted that it would be a long-term time horizon before we saw some of the results. Uh, but Dr. Crittner, earlier in your uh, kind of discussion, you noted that we need to show a return at a state level in five years. Uh, and so it seems like we have a serious measurement issue on our hands. And I'm just wondering if you have any thoughts in terms of how the state's looking at approaching that, or, or uh, maybe from others in terms of how how are we looking to show results, understanding that the results we're looking for are going to be potentially five decades, you know, a decade, 15 years down the road? So, you know, I think how do we look at kind of the short-term wins? How is that going to be displayed? And then kind of what is that longer-term measurement strategy? Oh, should I pipe in <laughs> the research side of it? Um, so I think that we are currently generating a tremendous amount of data from all these different healthcare systems. And one of the real challenges is uh, how we can kind of merge those data sets. So how do we really come up with a picture of how things are at a state level when you have all these different hospitals who are collecting data in different ways, who are analyzing that data in different ways? You're not able to track when the same patient goes to four different hospitals for admissions and really be able to understand what's going on with their trajectory. So I think it's really important with all the data we currently already have that we find ways to measure it consistently, collect it consistently across multiple health systems so that we can actually uh, generate results that make sense for, you know, again, at a state level or at a larger level. So I would say that I think we currently have a lot of data that can provide insight into some of those questions that we don't need to wait years for, but we just aren't doing a good job right now with managing all that data that's being collected. Can I just address before you go too far the ROI issue? <clears throat> I, I mentioned five years because of our 1115 waiver that we have to show savings during, the, we have to bring the trend down. So. Those investments that we're going to make through the 1115 have to, most of them, ha enough of them, have to show uh, an ROI. Um, doesn't mean all of them have to, and doesn't mean we're not going to probably look more broadly, uh, but that's one thing. But that doesn't mean we don't think in the long term. And I think one thing that Lewis County, which I think is doing the right thing, is they're taking some of their 0.1% sales tax piece that is uh, they can they can levy and they did voluntarily and they're putting that into screening for ACEs for instance that's adverse childhood events and which you, you can explain more about it because you're doing it but that's a longer term thing and you get some short term benefit but there's not a lot of money in it, savings but it's, it makes a huge difference in your education system and a lot of other things so I think you know uh, yes we have to think of the five year for us because we have to make sure we do that but we also have to think of the long term and I think long term you know uh, you're better off if people have jobs you know they have a good place to live you know they're healthy healthy families and you can't get an ROI from all, all everything we do but on some things we have to if we're going to take this money and reinvest it. 
And I think if you, if you really drill it down to an individual or a family, the ROI is immediate. If you can take one person or one child and make them feel safe in a school environment to talk to their counselor and they're looking forward to coming to school every day, that's going to be a huge ROI for that person in the long run. Uh, in, I mean, in the short term and in the long run. So uh, there are, it depends on how you look at it. Our, our ROI, um, from our perspective at this level, takes time. But if we're looking at helping the individual and the families, it's almost immediate for them. Uh, and just so you had mentioned that each system sort of in silos is collecting data, do you have a recommendation or do you have uh, sort of any insights of, if we could, like what would be the solution for that then? How could we work where Harborview ZR is communicating with UW ZR with, you know, to, to or, or, you know, the data collection? Like we have so much data, so what should we be doing with it? So I think there are a couple of things. I mean, so one is that unfortunately right now, hospitals are um, each using different um, clinical data programs, drawing a blank at the name here. So, um, you know, Epic is at some place, thank you, EHRs. Um, so we don't have consistency there. So that makes it a little challenging because every, even when you have, you know, the same EHR at two different institutions, there's still minor ways in which they're different, and they're just not standardized at all. So I think one challenge is thinking about how we can develop a more common EHR that's used. I think the other is metrics. So uh, it's bringing all these different stakeholders together to kind of identify what are the standards in terms of data collection. How should we be collecting race and ethnicity data? It seems like a simple concept, and yet, you know, are you asking the patient? Was it the administrator at the check-in who entered that information? How reliable is this data? So it's being able to have standards that are consistent about how that data is collected and that that data is valid and reliable. And then I think it's having that IT infrastructure to actually have ways in which data can talk to each other from these different systems. There's quite a bit of work going on in the community. <laughs> each, each of these steps uh, represents huge challenges. So, for example, uh, there was a large community investment of time and talent in coming up with a common me measure set for the state innovation grant. And I don't know how many hours of people time went into that, but we have 55 measures, six, 56 measures. I was obviously ringside for some of this, <laughs> um, you know, so that, that are defined in a particular way, you know, so hopefully the quality of the inputs when data is collected and, and the target goals for the quality performance across healthcare will be much more standardized in our state. I've just been involved with a uh, process that the State Hospital Association is running about healthcare disparities and the entire first uh, meeting, and I don't think we're done with this, is exactly if how do you define race, ethnicity, langu home language preference, all these different kinds of things. How can we even measure it before we get on to what is the impact of not doing this well? You know, so it's yeah, it's hard to move the needle super fast, but um, but there are, I think that in our community, even in Seattle, the big city. We're still small enough, we know each other, and people say, well, you, could you become, be part of this process, and, and people show up, but it, there are a lot of um, very complex intermediate steps that are trying to be cleared at this point, I would say, by the community. So I want to follow up on some of the ROI discussion earlier. How much data do we have in terms of uh, if you spend X amount of dollars in one of the social determin determinants, how much cost reduction do you get in the actual healthcare needed or healthcare delivered? Uh, is there hard data there? That's number one. And assuming that data is there, I would assume the conclusion you would want is if you invest more in the earlier stages in the social determinants, your healthcare needs go down. But that's almost putting the healthcare commu delivery community 
uh, on the other side, right? Because if you succeed, yes. your need for healthcare actually goes down, which means you need fewer institutions, fewer doctors. So how does the community feel about that? Um, the first one, though, is uh, we have studies. We don't have direct links. So we know that we invest in certain things. Studies have been done locally and nationally that show that if you do certain things, other things, you can save savings. The, the problem is uh, there, there are two major problems. One is you have to link them up really well to be able to do that which means you have to follow the individual and the intervention and then whether that person uses fewer services. Even if they use fewer services, a good example is the uh, wet, what do they call it, the, where people didn't have to give up alcohol in Seattle, the, the something building, the, you know, it was 1116 or something, they had a name for it anyway, a building, uh, apartment house that people could live in if they were homeless and were drinking and they didn't have to give up drinking, they just moved in. So. Uh, it showed that it saved $4 million, and most of that was at Harborview Emergency Room. But there was no connection between Harborview, because Harborview still ran its emergency room and still was busy and had no, you know, still was putting people in the hallways because they didn't have enough room for them, so there was no, you know, real savings there. Those, that population didn't go there, other populations did. So, you know, the question is not just can you identify the people in the intervention, which we don't do well, uh, to the outcome, and that's one of the few places we've done it uh, in real time. But we also have to figure a way we, how we save that money. Did we save money and how do we reinvest it? So it's a much more complex uh, endeavor than one could imagine. There is some very good work being done. It's interesting, at both DSHS collecting a lot of information uh, and I'd say that uh, a guy named Dave Mancuso is one of the smartest people I know around data stuff where he's looking at individuals that are part of Medicaid as well as uh, be, uh, behavioral health. The interesting thing, though, is we have a terrible collection. We have holes in our system, huge holes. One of the biggest interventions that can make a difference is behavioral health, yet we don't even have a data, a regular data collection around behavioral health in all the different BHOs. They don't have, a lot of them don't have EMRs, or if they do, they're inconsistent, and we can't, it's hard to even pull those in. So. I think you know we're. I think the better part of Val right now on this issue is that we start developing standards, we start collecting data, we start you know organizing the best we can, and we won't ever have perfect data, but we start have to being action taking action on the data we have as we move forward, and trying to uh, I think using different structures to be able to do the I'll say the financial integration. Just a couple other. Um, first of all, I appreciate the question. Um, because it will need to be asked and answered at every step of the way. Because um, our system's reinforcing the outcomes we're getting. And it's doing it at all levels. Uh, I would say uh, what gives me hope and encouragement is a couple of things. First of all, Center for Medicaid and Medicare Services is rapidly trying to say, we're going to flip the equation to pay for value, which means drive from quality and service experience and providers and practitioners and systems that are delivering that are, are, are going to be reasonably well funded going forward. The healthcare authority in the state has said by 2018, I want 60% in value based purchasing, and they purchase a lot of healthcare, um, either through the public employees, for the public employees, or for the Medicaid beneficiaries. And so there are, there are milestones and stakes being put in the ground to say if we don't boldly take the system to a different place, it will not change itself. And so how these legislators align around these, align around these milestones is fundamentally important for us to start shifting the trajectory, which will allow us to make investments in other parts of the circle. So I'm, I'm encouraged that you can see those milestones. Lots of things could happen to get in the way. National elections, state elections, bills that come forward. Uh, but it's the, the, I think Bob said it earlier, there's, it's got the positive attention and it has to just keep moving. I got a question for you back here, I guess. Um, so two questions. The first is, what about using the emergency department information exchange as a way to um, capture data across systems? 
Um, and, and I would add, um, how about using your fire departments and your police? Um, because they're, they're actually on the front line uh, of that as well. I think it's a fascinating question. I mean, first of all, um, it was referenced before. There, there is uh, incentives now and, and also p uh, processes in place to get these disparity HRs to begin to link. And again, healthcare authority has put a stake in the ground that if you're funded through a Medicaid program, you're gonna have to submit uh, to a common data platform. It's those kinds of activities that start to move the dial. I would just say as I've met and talked with our um, homeless outreach workers, um, I don't want to undersell the fact that our EMS system and our police systems are oftentimes the front line of healthcare here. And somebody in this room, I hope, is thinking about what's the application for a police officer to say, I have so and so in front of me, and that pings a caseworker's cell phone that says, I'm that patient's, I'm that individual's caseworker. Here's where we can take them, and here's how we can intervene that'll be more effective than you taking them to the jail. At some point in time, creating those kind of innovations, I don't know what the economic model is underneath it, I just know the need is huge. Can I, on that last question, was that about uh, the yeah, Eddie? Yeah. Eddie. Yeah. Eddie. Um, and so, actually, it's very interesting. I know that Eddie started Eddie. here in Washington State, and it's a, a database uh, that was started with ERs so that people could tell what was going on in ERs essentially in real time. And from a clinical management perspective, knowing anything in real time is phenomenal. And so it, um, I ha when I talk to people in other states, they're like, wow, you can do that. <laughs> but um, I think that the build out of Eddie and the sort of uh, uh, the use of it by, by folks, whether it's caseworkers or primary care docs to have care plans in it. So when somebody does show up at an ER, Sometimes these are people that are hard to outreach and find, and you can tell that almost immediately. Um, also, people that are trying to provide care in the ER can tell that these are people known to parts of the system so that the right care is done and they know, you know what the person's issues really are that need to be addressed at the time. But it's um, a phenomenal uh, resource that we have in our community, and I know it's spreading now, but um, just that's that was a great intervention, but in, and it is a place where a lot of these social determinants show up. People go to the ER when things aren't good, so. So we're starting to drift into a territory I really enjoy, which is um, changes in legislation, especially where they drive standards. So I see that MACRA is on the buzzword board over there. Are there other changes in legislation that have impacted you and your work with um, social determinants? Just, you know, since my time back at the governor's office, we've had a lot of different things that are very similar to that. One is you know, one bill, 2572, I think it was, where we talked about doing value-based purchasing and a lot of other things, basically putting in statute what we needed for the Healthier Washington Initiative. Uh, 6302 was a bill that talked about what we do with the behavioral health system and um, has a fairly simple clause in there that moves uh, has us integrate fully by 2020, so that's a big one. There are, you know, you can, it depends on how broadly you go, there's a lot of different things out there. Um, and um, so there's been a, a lot, like with children, we've been working a lot with uh, what we call Healthiest Next Generation. And uh, well, uh, what that, that really is just the best practices, like, counties like Lewis County, what they've done, other counties uh, trying to get that spread around to different places. So there's a lot of legislation out there we can talk about, but I'll say there's an appreciation for it, but the, the big uh, hurdle I think over the years has been that we, I mean, for years we've been talking about some good things we need to do. The question is how do we actually change the system? Uh, and we haven't done that. We've been talking about it and we're starting to do it, I think now, um, it's gonna take a little bit, a lot more work to make it irreversible. In other words, to move things, get people to change what they're doing. We have to align the financing system, we have to align those statutes, and so we're, like for this coming year, we're probably gonna come in with statutes having to do with behavioral health and how we bring that in you know, more closely. 
uh, there's work by Department of Health looking at a lot of the social determinants of what kind of services need to be in every community that, that you need to really move forward. Um, and it's in commerce is doing a lot of stuff around housing and how do we develop supportive housing. So there's stuff going on that, and you almost need a, you know, kind of a czar to kind of look at it and say, what are all those pieces? Because they're in different agencies, they're in different organizations, you know, the organizations, people are doing a lot of things in a lot of different places. Um, and we're hoping that the ACH concept will bring at least those people in the local communities who are active so they can coordinate what they're doing for their own region. Um, so it, it, those things are happening, um, and it's a matter of making sure we use the right incentives, use our money that we, whatever we have, efficiently and effectively, uh, and to keep this activity going. Now, with anything, you never really done. You know, everything we do, we're always trying to prove it. So, but we have to make it a big enough step in a, while everybody's moving on this that we have. I'll say the incentives aligned so it continues to uh, continual, I'll say continual improvements and uh, it doesn't slide back to where it was. And I think nobody really wants it to slide back, but inertia is a huge thing. And there are a lot of groups inside the state, outside the state, that would be very happy with the way things are in the past. So, so I think Bob, uh, Dr. Crittenden gave us a new word, gave me one, so I'm gonna remember, ir irreversible good. So you can go back and look at the legislation that funded uh, the original, um, that allowed FQHCs to get started. You can go back to the seminal moment when Medicare sort of came into being as, in 2013 is not that far ago, 20, uh, 2012 in the, uh, when the Affordable Care Act. What's happening with, at the state, trying to make it irreversible to pay for anything other than quality first um, with the health care authority trying to use this waiver to, the, these are moments in legislations. I think we need one more election cycle on the national level to feel like the Affordable Care actually isn't reversible. Uh, so pay attention. Uh, that's it for a political comment. Uh, how you elect all down the stream, uh, all down ballot, makes a huge amount of difference at these, these moments. So I would say these are moments, if we care about that circle change in its trajectory, while it may be focused on health care, those are, and this housing uh, levy that just passed um, is also very focused on trying to go after the housing first challenge, which is one of those key bubbles. So I would say we've got good momentum, and it matters how we, uh, as community uh, participants, show up. So do we have, uh I, I'm yeah. wondering if we should have one more question. I don't know if you guys want to do any wrap up after that, but then maybe we can break and mingle and access some things over here. Does that sound okay? <laughs> and from the far corner here. Yeah. Uh, uh, my name is Keith Sims. I'm a volunteer with a group called Heroes for the Homeless. Uh, our 10th anniversary is this November. Uh, we do outreach around Seattle. Um, and I recognize all four of the stories that that you've told me I've recognized from our outreach. Um, for example, a gentleman by the name of Juan who lives under I-5, just yeah. not even a mile away from here, uh, was promised periodontal work and it was affecting and has been affecting his heart. And uh, I guess they lost the money and I'd love to find out, and the reason why I'm asking the question is, how do you work with organizations like ours? We go out once a month, twice a month in the winter time um, and bring supplies, tents, clothing, socks, et cetera, food. Um, how do you work with um, organizations like ours to leverage what you have available for a boots on the ground kind of organization like us? Because what it sounds like you have, I would love for us to be able to partner and, and bring that to the folks that we throw blankets over the back of at four o'clock, five o'clock in the morning, you know? Yeah, one of the, um, first of all, thanks for the, um, for the, the question and, and your stories as well. So one of the remarkable things here is that you don't go after social determinants of health without having a lot of partners. And more importantly, you'll see in some of the, the literature around this, you actually should not predetermine uh, what the solutions are until the partners have come together uh, with, with the clients, if you will, and thought through what is the next step. So happy to figure out how we partner with you. 
we, we don't do any of this work without at least three partners uh, in tow or we're in their tow uh, trying to figure out how to uh, have positive results. So ha happy to figure out how to connect. And do you want to talk about who's at the table for the ACNs or? I mean, in the accountable communities of health, that's one of the design features is right. to have right. more than just the medical folks talking amongst themselves. Yeah. Uh, sure, so our accountable community of health is Cascade Pacific Action Alliance. It encompasses seven counties. Let's see if I can remember them all. Uh, Thurston, Mason, Lewis, Pacific, Grays Harbor, Cowlitz, and Wakayakum. Is that seven? Woohoo! <laughs> You're my witness. I did it right. Uh, so um, each county has three seats on the council, um, specifically three seats. So it has to have uh, one local public health agency representative, one um, provider representative, so any type of um, physician or nurse or hospital, something like that, and then one social services provider. So that's the minimum. And then there are also uh, other seats available from um, the region as a whole. So we have quite the diverse group, probably out of the seven counties, if we all had three seats, there would be you know, do the math, 20, 21 people. Uh, we have about 40 or so. So it's, it's, it's great we have, have uh, one member from every, each of the five, uh, uh, can't think of the word, plans, the managed care plans. Yeah. Yeah, so, so and I've learned a great deal in working with them. Um, one of our, the things that our accountable community of health does and has incorporated recently is that every meeting will have a learning session. And so we had, uh, for example, two months ago at our meeting, we had the CEOs of our two BHOs in the region, uh, Behavioral Health Organization, come and t just talk to us about what it was like getting those organization started and how they were going. Uh, so it's a great opportunity to learn for those of us in the room that are not part of, say, a BHO or not part of a hospital, or for those that, from us, from our perspective, that are not part of public health. And uh, it's it's been great. We're making um, good strides in the right direction. We have a youth behavioral health services pilot project going on in four of the schools, um, four different counties, one school in each of the counties. And uh, something that Dr. Bob was referring to earlier, uh, Lewis County, even prior to this pilot project in the region, Lewis County was doing a similar thing in all of our school districts in the county using our one-tenth of one percent mental health sales tax, which was another legislation piece that has really been beneficial. Uh, we have actually been able to partner with our mental health organization named Cascade, and they are able to put at least a part-time mental health counselor in every one of our elementary school districts. And so the kids are uh, referred to the program, we call it the Early Intervention Program, uh, the kids are referred to the program from anyone. It can come from a, a bus driver, a cafeteria worker, a teacher, of course, um, parents, anybody can refer a child. They get the counseling free of charge, and the whole purpose is to try to get them settled down and back into the class so that they can learn and not disrupt the rest of the class from learning. So that's just one example. We're, um, a, the Accountable Community of Health is also doing that youth behavioral pilot project very similar to the same thing in the elementary schools in those four different counties, and we hope to expand it soon. Does anybody have some wrap-up statements, or would you like to remingle? Since, since I have it, I'll go ahead and um, wrap up. One thing I would just like to add, when we were talking earlier about the ER departments and hospitals talking back and forth with data. Uh, we see that at the local level that it's also very important for what we term the high utilizers of the criminal justice system as well. And uh, one 
um, grassroots effort that I have seen work really well is a collaborative group that pretty much knows these people. They know who they are. They know the wands that live under the um, bridges. And, and so they get together on a periodic basis, not very often, say quarterly or so, but they talk and they say, well, who's been serving this person? Who's been serving this person? Do we know where they're at? Are they still in our county? Have they left? What can we do to help them? And they're able to, there's law enforcement on this group, and so they're able to, when they run into this person, and rather than arrest them, they can contact someone that would be more appropriate to, to serve this person and try to find them a bed, whether it's just for one night or for a few days in um, either our Cascade Mental Health or uh, we have an apartment building that our sales tax is paying for that's pretty much barrier free, like a wet house that uh, try, try to get them in there uh, at least for the night to settle them down, get them back on meds, whatever it takes before they can go back into the community. Th and I wanna say thank you for having me here today. This has been very good, thanks. I just want to say one thing, and that is that we often think of health care, we think of health outcomes, but we, uh, I think we're really trying to move now to say, how do we make the health, uh, help our families have better health overall, their kids growing up, as well as their, the, uh, the adults live longer and healthier. And we have huge disparities, just on the mental health one, they die, people with severe mental illness die 20 years or so uh, earlier than their peers. Uh, but you look at different populations, different groups, uh, important to bring everybody up, including people who are uh, very well to do. One of the things that, that's important is that we, you, I, you mentioned the, the fact that it, you know income has a lot to do with how people do. The important thing in the United States is that our wealthiest group, our top one fifth, are actually not as healthy as the bottom one-fifth of England, which means our healthiest people are not as well. And it's not just those people who get affected by a lousy system. It's all of us. And I think it's important for us to understand that this is not just trying to be good for the poor people, yeah. but this is actually going to make a difference in all of our lives. That's a, that's a great point. So um, uh, you're going to accuse me of being a preacher here in a minute, but um, I'll, I'll, be, I'll be succinct. We really are in a pretty special time. You know, maybe it's just where I feel like I've come in my professional career to have a city asking the question around how do we uh, affect social determinants, to be in a state, to be in a county asking the same question, to be in a state asking the same question. Um, I don't know of a time in my professional career or memory when that has been true. And so what we do uh, from this point forward, again, is critically important. And the fact that you showed up uh, to this topic would say it's on your mind too. So let's keep going forward. We're doing the right thing. Thank you. Uh, yes, yeah, so thanks again for having me. Uh, this has been a really great conversation. I think the things I wanted to leave you with are one, how powerful social determinants of healthcare are, that it influences health across the entire spectrum. So from preventive health through end of life, there's a role. Uh, and I can't think of that many things that have such a powerful role. So I think, one, it's wonderful to see people thinking about this. From my end, it's been great to see more and more research about this topic, and then all the way to the legislative actions to try and actually address these problems and create solutions. And I think the other point I wanted to make when we were talking about how a lot of these uh, circles are siloed in terms of departments and funding streams is to think about the way, hopefully, in which research will inform us about these connections and these associations. How do these complex factors all interact with each other and then translate to the outcomes we're seeing? So I think there's a lot of work to be done, uh, but it's great to see that we're making a lot of progress. 
Well, I'd like to thank this uh, great set of panelists. I've certainly learned a lot, and it's been really good to hear from all of you. And I'd like to thank Cambia Grove for pitching the topic, and uh, Dave in particular for keeping us organized. That was wonderful, and providing uh, for the next part of the evening. And hopefully, if you guys have questions or comments or whatever, that you feel free to let any of us know. So thank you. Thank you, Mary Kay.